Chapter Seventeen of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter Seventeen: A Council of War. Shocky, whose feet had flown as soon as he saw the final fall of Pete Jones, told the whole story to the wondering and admiring ears of Miss Hawkins, who unhappily could not remember anything at the East just like it. To the frightened ears of the rheumatic old lady who felt sure her old man's talk and stubbornness would be the ruin of him, and to the indignant ears of the old soldier who was hobbling up and down, sentinel-wise, in front of his cabin, standing guard over himself. "'No, I won't leave,' he said to Rolf and Bud. "'You see, I just won't. What would General Winfield Scott say if he knew that one of them as fit at Lundy's Lane backed out, retreated, run for fear of a passel of thieves. No, sir, me and the old flintlock will live and die together. I'll put a thunder in charge of buckshot into the first one of them scoundrels as comes up the holler. It'll be another Lundy's Lane. And you, Mr. Hartsook, may send Scott word that old Pearson, as fit at Lundy's Lane under him, died a fightin' thieves on Rocky Branch, in Hoopole County, State of Ingenie, and the old man hobbled faster and faster, taxing his wooden leg to the very utmost, as if his victory depended on the vehemence with which he walked his beat. Mrs. Pearson sat wringing her hands and looking appealingly at Martha Hawkins, who stood in the door, in despair, looking appealingly at Bud. Bud was stupefied by the old man's stubbornness and his own pain, and in his turn appealed mutely to the master, in whose resources he had boundless confidence. Rolf, seeing that all depended on him, was taxing his wits to think of some way to get round Pearson's stubbornness. Shocky hung to the old man's coat and pulled away at him with many entreating words, but the venerable, bare-headed sentinel strode up and down furiously, with his flintlock on his shoulder and his basket-knife in his belt. Just at this point somebody could be seen indistinctly through the bushes coming up the hollow. "'Halt!' cried the old hero. "'Who goes there?' "'It's me, Mr. Pearson. Don't shoot me, please.' It was the voice of Hannah Thompson, hearing that the whole neighborhood was rising against the benefactor of Shockey and of her family. She had slipped away from the eyes of her mistress, and run with breathless haste to give warning in the cabin on Rocky Branch. Seeing Rolf, she blushed and went into the cabin. "'Well,' said Rolf, "'the enemy is not coming yet. Let us hold a council of war. This thought came to Rolf like an inspiration. It pleased the old man's whim, and he sat down on the doorstep. Now, I suppose, said Rolf, that General Winfield Scott always looked into things a little before he went into a fight, didn't he? To be sure, assented the old man. Well, said the Rolf, what is the condition of the enemy? I suppose the whole neighborhood's against us. "'To be sure,' said the old man. The rest were silent, but all felt the statement to be about true. "'Next,' said Rolf, "'I suppose General Winfield Scott would always inquire into the condition of his own troops. Now let us see. Captain Pearson has Bud, who is the right wing, badly crippled by having his arm broken in the first battle. Miss Hawkins looked pale. "'To be sure,' said the old man. "'And I am in the left wing,' "'Pretty good at giving advice, but very slender in a fight. "'To be sure,' said the old man. "'And Shockey and Miss Martha, and Hannah, good aides, but nothing in a battle. "'To be sure,' said the basket-maker, a little doubtfully. "'Now let's look at the arms, and accoutrements, I think you call them. "'Well, this old musket has been loaded. "'This ten year,' said the old lady. "'And the lock is so rusty that you could not cock it when you wanted to take aim at Hannah.' The old man looked foolish, and muttered, "'To be sure. And there isn't another round of ammunition in the house.' The old man was silent. "'Now, let us look at the encumbrances. Here's the old lady and Shockey. If you fight, the enemy will be pleased. It will give them a chance to kill you. And then the old lady will die, and they will do to Shockey as they please.' "'To be sure,' said the old man, reflectively. Now, said Rolf, General Winfield Scott, under such circumstances, would retreat in good order. Then, when he could muster his forces rightly, he would drive the enemy from his ground. 
"'To be sure,' said the old man. "'What were I to do?' "'Have you any friends?' "'Well, yes. There's my brother over in Jackson County. I mount go there.' "'Well,' said Bud, "'do you just go down to Spring and Rock and stay there. Them folks won't be here till midnight. I'll come for you at nine with my roan colt, and I'll set you down over on the big road on Buckeye Run. Then you can get on the mail wagon that passes there about five o'clock in the morning, and go over to Jackson County and keep shady till we want you to face the enemy, and to swear again some folks, and then we'll send for you. To be sure, said the old man in a broken voice, I reckon General Winfield Scott wouldn't disapprove of such a maneuver as that thar. Miss Martha beamed on Bud to his evident delight, for he carried his painful arm part of the way home with her. Ralph noticed that Hannah looked at him with a look full of contending emotions. He read admiration, gratitude, and doubt in the expression of her face as she turned toward home. "'Well, good-bye, old woman,' said Pearson, as he took up his little handkerchief full of things and started for his hiding-place. "'Good-bye. I didn't never think I'd desart you, and if the old flintlock hadn't a been rusty, I'd a stayed and died right here by the old cabin. But I reckon tain't best to be brash.' And Shocky looked after him as he hobbled away over the stones, more than ever convinced that God had forgotten all about things on Flat Creek. He gravely expressed his opinion to the master the next day. End of chapter 17